Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. Ellen Dolan joined the cast of Guiding Light as Maureen Reardon in 1982 with Harley Jane Kozak and Michael Woods as Annabelle Sims and Dr. Jim Reardon following a year later in 1983. This talented group of actors and the characters they portrayed left a mark on the Springfield canvas that now, four decades later, draws as much excitement as it did back in the 80s when they were playing these parts and we were all tuning in day after day after day. Please welcome to the locker room, Ellen Dolan, Harley Jane Kozak, and Michael Woods. Ellen, Harley. Hey guys. Hi everybody. Hello, hello. Thanks for being here. Yeah. So, so can you go can you go back to 1982? Is the memory clear and, mm -hmm. and hearing about these roles? Yeah. Can, what 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 do you remember about getting the audition for Maureen? Oh, I was insane for about ten days. That you they had a you could wait ten days to hear whether you were hired or not. And the last day, I was working a temp job, and I called my machine like every hour on the hour. <laughs> Answering machines when you had a dial from the payphone. <laughs> yeah. And I heard nothing, and it was the 10th day, and I took the subway all the way home. I lived at the top of uh, Manhattan up in Inwood, and I was just so dejected. And finally, my agent got a hold of me, and she said, where have you been? I'm like, well, I know, it's terrible. She said, no, you got it. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> I actually fell apart. I just, I lost it. I, I just, I was so beside myself. And then... Um, you know, it started and it was just like this whole wonderful big world that I kind of knew because I had watched Guiding Light. Um, so I just... Oh, started. did I, I didn't recall that. You grew up watching Guiding Light? I didn't grow up watching it, but I had watched... Uh, my sister came home one summer uh, and... Um, <sighs> She watched As the World Turns and Guiding Light. And I had gone to school in London with uh, Kathy, Kathleen, 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 who played the piano. Kathleen, long. On, on Guiding Light? Yeah, Guiding Light. Kathleen, uh, is it Cullen? Cullen, Cullen. I'd gone to school in London. I think she, she played Amanda, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. So that's how I started watching. And uh, wow. so I knew everybody. I knew the Reardons. And, uh, so were you were you intimidated, uh, you know, sort of walking in the door? I was too young to know to be intimidated. It was just uh, uh, learning all those lines, all that, all those lines so quickly was intimidating. Um, but uh, I don't think I knew enough to be intimidated. I was just mm -hmm. sort of stunned that it all. And Harley, for you, what what do you remember about getting the audition for Annabelle? Well, I came in uh, shortly after Gail Kobe took over as executive producer, and she brought in um, some writers, um, among them Pam Long, yeah. who was later Pam Long Hammer, and, um, and John Weitzel. I can't remember what he had to do with it. I think maybe he directed the audition or something, but anyway... Um, so I knew those people and I had just come from a show called Texas, which had just been canceled. And so um, uh, I auditioned for it, but I knew the people, which was completely exciting. Um, it was, you know, no guarantee you'd get the job, but at least it, I was surrounded by familiar faces. And so, um, but in my personal life, I think I had just gotten a divorce and, or I was in the middle of it. And I had just moved from this big loft on uh, West, on Hollywood between Prince and Spring. No. No, there's no Hollywood West, down there. West here. Broadway, sorry. Yeah. Broadway. <laughs> West Broadway. West Broadway you, you were combining the coasts. <laughs> yeah. You lived in Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. So I had just moved into this tiny little apartment um, on uh, near the NYU campus right around from the law school and um it was it was you know like this big and i just remember i was going through a tough sad time and so getting that job was just 
such a blessing. Mm -hmm. And I too had grown up watching Guiding Light because my, uh, my grandmother lived with us and she'd be ironing and watching what she called her programs. Mm -hmm. So they were Search for Tomorrow, um, Guiding Light, and um, As the World Turns and Edge of Night. Yes, yes. So I know, I too knew all these people, um, hadn't watched them since I was little, but I remember growing up thinking that, you know, Bert Bauer was part of my family. So it was, I figured it was my grandmother up in heaven negotiating that contract and working out that storyline. So that's crazy. Did um, you have to screen test with um, Greg Beecroft? Did they know Tony and Annabelle were going to be together? Yes, I did. I was certainly introduced to be his love interest. So I'm going to guess yes, but I actually don't remember. I don't remember that right. part. Yeah. Right. Those okay. were my drug days, Alan. So uh, <laughs> it's a long, hey, I, I understand. <laughs> and and Michael, what do you remember about the audition and screen test? Any of any of the above? Well. I too like Harley. I was fortunate I had come off Texas. Texas. And ironically, the day we wrapped on Texas, I flew out to uh, to California and auditioned for a new show called Bear Essence, which was with Jeannie Francis. And it was her nighttime debut. It was Ian McShane and John Danaher and, and Jessica Walter who passed away. Uh, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and I fortunately, I got that. It was my Christmas present <laughs> to, from NBC to, to me. So I got this show and it went great. And, you know, it, it went great for 12 episodes. And then <laughs> I was unemployed again. And then somewhere around, so I was 83. And I had bought a condo in LA and it looked like I was going to do this other series. And then tested didn't get that didn't get a couple things and you know the manager's going well you just gotta wait a few years you gotta look a little older you gotta look like Tom Selleck it was in that age when you had to look like quote unquote a man and I still had a little bit of a boyish still look to me yeah I guess I guess in their minds you know you start listening to everybody else so uh, so I'm sitting there going God I'm not gonna work for a while okay I gotta accept this and I happen to be walking down down 8th Avenue at 53rd Street, look into a cafe, and who's sitting there but Harley? <laughs> you remember this? No. No? Wow. You know, I'm light. I'm on drugs. And, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she I was sitting there, and she was telling me how, how uh, you know, how she was doing, and everything was great, and how much, you know, Gail's over at uh, 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 doing Guiding Light, and you should give her a call. And I gave Gail a call. So everything, I owe my success to Harley. Harley, well, I didn't have to audition. Well, to, to the gods of New York, because, you know, that's yes. just, that is yeah. New York City. I, I yeah. That's, you know, I have been, because of the pandemic, I mean, I had moved out of the city. But one of my favorite things is walking down the streets of New York, and you just, you know, you bump into somebody you know. It's, it's the true. best. It really is like that magic of New York. And yeah. that. Truly, you know, that that time of you two just bumping into each other, it's like, boom. Yeah. I'm seeing boom. one of my favorite vagrants from the village up on the Upper East Side. Like, <laughs> and thinking, how did she get all the way up here? And, why did she change that? Drugs. <laughs> drugs <laughs> that's gonna be the that's gonna be the theme um so you gail was the ep of texas and then moved over when it was canceled i gather so um for and and michael did you even have to audition or she said actually there's a part that we're writing as for a doctor and i'm like awesome i said you know my dad's a doctor you know, he'd be very happy that I'm finally playing a doctor. I said, it'd be a good thing. So, yeah, I didn't have to audition. I got lucky. She said, that's awesome. She, she, you know, because we had worked together and everything else. So, uh, if, so, if you knew you had to cure the dreaming death, would you have taken the role? 
Can I, Alan, don't, don't go down my rabbit hole. Um, oh, well, are, you are, are you kidding? Car yeah. Ka one of our fans, Ka yeah. Karen just asked, memories of the Dreaming Death storyline and your time in Barbados. Oh. She, said, she said that was uh, their college years. Oh, my God. It was a dreaming death. It was death. Trust me, I couldn't wait to, to die. <laughs> Carolyn Clark. You did, oh, Leslie Carolyn. Ann. Oh, Leslie my Ann. best friend. Oh, mm -hmm. Carolyn was fucking awesome. You were awesome. Ellen was awesome. I had a great time doing it. It was just, God, some of the language I had to learn and, and a cure for the dreaming death. <laughs> did, like, your dad, did your dad help you with uh, the words? <laughs> My dad just shook his head. He says, like, no, no doctor story I've ever seen. I said, I agree. I didn't think, I'd be, I didn't think that was the, the, the storyline they had in mind when they said you get to play a doctor. Doctor, right. Yeah. When you get to play a doctor. So right. Ellen and Harley, um, you know, growing up watching, and then there's, you know, Sharita Bauer in front of you, and we're, uh, Ellen, you marry, you know, her on-screen son. What was Sharita like? What do you remember about Sharita? Oh, she was great. She was just, it, you'd never expect her to be funny and charming and, well, charming. Yeah, she was always charming. But um, I, I remember, I think I've said this before on one of your shows, but the hallways in the, in the dressing rooms, the hallways were just the right length or uh, width for me to climb up the walls. And I used to climb up the walls and get up into where the pipes were. And she came in with a, a tour group at one point. And there I was just hanging over them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my whole ass just hanging out there. <laughs> and she very simply walked underneath and went, oh, hello, dear. <laughs> <laughs> she is really funny. She was wonderful. She is very, very old school and lovely lady and funny. Uh, some fans today sent around a clip to me of her, one of her last interviews after she had her leg amputated and, you know, they incorporated that in. But uh, it was, it, I hadn't really seen Sharita speak in a long time, so it was nice to see, to see her. But uh, Harley, what do you remember? I just, I remember um, she really was lovely. She was the the world's matriarch and I, I'm still bitter about the fact that they didn't go dark for her funeral. Like I thought mm. that we should all, like we could go to her funeral if we had the day off. But I remember being upset by that. Mm. Um, the show must go on. Yeah. Yeah. You got to work, and you also worked with Will, Will, Bill Rorick, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. What was he like? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, you're talking to me, Alan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was. Sorry, Harley. <laughs> okay, I another thing I have no memory of. I will say, in my defense, um, <laughs> he was wonderful. He, he really was. Um, he, you know, the, everybody on there was pretty much like you'd expect them to be. You know, that well, except for, you know, the murderers, but um, <laughs> really all the nice people and the, the lifers, the long-term characters were just as embracing and warm and wonderful as you'd expect there like i zero disappointments i will well, say are, defense, there were a few murderers there during your time yes there were <laughs> and and i will say that um carrie nye was delightful in person um definitely an eccentric but not a murderer you know <laughs> as far as i know um she was scary and, to us viewers Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And my, oh, and the guy who played my dad, who was a murderer. Um, <laughs> oh, the flashbacks, was, right? I, I can't remember. His name was Stephen, and I, oh, I'd have to look up his last name. Sorry, I should have done some research before so this. Somebody will. Um, somebody will tell us. Yeah, Stephen Joyce. 
See, so told you. Thank you, Stephen Joyce. <laughs> really Thanks, great Luther. guy. He, you know, he was very quiet. Eli uh, Sims. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but he was a scary character. And the actor who played him, I just remember him being a man of few words, but really, really nice. Um, and uh, who else, Michael? Who else Who? Who else was um, after us? Michael and I, by the way, played brother and sister on Texas and right. then brother-in-law and sister-in-law in sister Guiding Light. And then we had a romance. So then, oh. you know, we had that. He's Almost my brother. He's my bit. lover. He's my brother. He's my lover. Yeah. Well, anyway. and and Ellen, he he was Ellen's brother, brother, and then lover on As the World Turns. But right, I think fantasy lover. I don't fantasy. I don't, yeah, we were. I don't know. You're not. Well, I can't remember Al Alec Wallace. I, I tried. Can't but I didn't get very far. <laughs> right. There was now, a couple of scenes where we we were in bed. So we must have done it. I don't know. I don't well, know. He, bed with I want to say it was fantasy in my mind. I and tried. You, and you were murdered on there. Yeah. Now we had to kill him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ellen, did you appear on Texas as well? No. No, that some was fans. So, yeah, some fans thought you, you had. So was Guiding Light your first television role? Yeah, it was kind of right out of college. But I want to tell you, Bill Rorick was the guy who, the person who introduced me to Wicca. So I found my religion through Bill. That That's thing. unexpected. Yeah, he's, that was wow. really pretty lovely. Huh. Yeah, I hear wonderful things about him. Yeah. That he was, and he had a sense of humor, I think. Him and Larry Gates. Little gentleman. Him and Larry Gates. And Harley, are you and Robert Newman cousins? Well, Who'd you hear that from, Alan? <laughs> Probably Robert. If if Robert said that we were, then yes. Uh, now okay. it's kind of cold. But all right, if sorry. Else I don't... Said it, if anyone else said it, no, it's a vicious rumor. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things where you know, I'm the repository of a lot of secrets, right? And then there, it seems there should be a statute of limitations on secrets because I forget. Like, I'll be telling a, a story and then I'll realize, oh, I that wasn't was supposed to that was locked. That was locked away. <laughs> yeah. So if you ever tell me a secret, I'm really good about confidentiality, but you have to, you know, you have to remind me every couple of years. It's still That's a secret. A lot of to clearance. What? Yeah. Go to Robert Newman to get clearance. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Robert, find out if, if he's okay if I tell the story. And if not, then it's a rumor. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, one of our fans, Ellen, says Margo went on about clicking heels in the Alec Wallace mystery for ages. Went on uh, about clicking heels. Yeah, I'm not sure what clicking heels means. Um, like I so, would there's no yeah. home. There's no home. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. So who or what influenced you on all on becoming actors? Michael, you want to go first? Oh, God. Um, well, I, I mean, I grew up, like I said, my dad was a doctor, so I certainly didn't grow up, you know, I grew up in Michigan, too. So, you know, pure old white boy, Roman Catholic, <clears throat> as I say, like I say, Roman Catholic, Irish. Good old boy, altar boy. That was my first stage experience, actually. Was I learned the Latin, the blocking, and said my first mass, and I was the first one in my class. In a so dress. That was actually my, yeah. In a dress. In a dress. In a dress, yeah. So that was my first acting experience, actually. And I did pretty good. So anyway, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I In college, I used to, well, you know, back to drugs and a few. <laughs> You know, <laughs> lighting my hockey stick on fire and giving concerts in the hallway and imitating guy. I don't know. I just, it, it, it was never something you ever thought of doing as a profession or making a living at it in any way, shape, or form. And I, I uh, had studied medicine for two years down at Xavier in Cincinnati. And I decided I didn't want to do that. Uh, came back, worked uh, as a uh, dialysis technician in the hospital for a little bit and decided to go to a school called Marygrove, 
uh, to see if about their acting department. Did a did a one act there, and asked them, "Do you think I have any possibility of doing this?" And and they, I said, "Be very blunt. Just do I have any any talent whatsoever?" And they said, "Whatsoever. You got a little bit of talent. Yes. So come join. Come join. We'll be happy to have you." Actually, it was a very very good prestigious. Uh, undergraduate uh, 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 theater school called University of Detroit Marygrove. We won the we won the uh, American College Theater Festival two out of the three years. I was there and go to the Kennedy Center to perform. And uh, in the dance department above, Madonna was there. So I mean, it was a very prestigious liberal arts college. And um, so I don't know. I kind of fell into it and uh, had some success at it a little bit. And I was in Detroit, so I was able to get my SAG card and my union cards because they shot more film footage because of the car industrial films there. So I was able to kind of get into the business professionally and make a couple bucks at it. And it just kind of, you know, one thing led to another. Hmm. You know? Harley, for you? Well, my mom was a, a music teacher and a singer. And... Um, and we followed her career around the country. So when I was five, we lived in Valley City, North Dakota. And my mom taught at Valley City State Teachers College. And she was uh, the witch in a production of the opera Dido and Aeneas. And they needed some angels. So they recruited kindergartners. And so that was me. And that was my first time on stage. And I was so thrilled by the experience, you know, when that that the house lights were dark. Like I wasn't prepared for how dramatic it would be because we hadn't rehearsed like that. I don't know, you know, I didn't have any lines. They just dragged us in and then dragged us off. And it, but it was so thrilling for a five-year-old that it was honestly a peak experience. And, um, and because I was the youngest of eight kids, I think that my mom, like she, there, was, there was somebody to sort of do all the other things you could do in life. And so by the time I came along, I thought, I think she probably thought it would be fine if I lived out her unlived life as a per performer. And so I, I just always remembered feeling like it would be unlike Michael's story. It would be a natural thing to be an actor. So um, I just never really questioned it. I, 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 we, I mostly was brought up in Nebraska and I just did a lot of theater and then moved to New York and went to the School of the Arts at NYU, um, the graduate acting program. And so Guiding Light was um, my first year out of, no, my third year, I guess, out of, out of NYU. So, um, yeah, I never really questioned it or thought about doing anything else until I hit like 40 yeah. and then I thought, you know, I think I want to write novels and have babies. And so I did. <laughs> <laughs> and that just, and the novels just came out at 40? Like you weren't writing all along? Well, in retrospect, it seems like it was all plotted, you know, like, like there, it seems like there was um, a method to it all. But at the time, no, I would get encouragement. And I knew that I was a, a, a compulsive writer, but I always thought I was writing in service to my acting. And then um, eventually I realized, no, I think, actually somebody told me I was writing something for a theater company and an actor called Michael Lombard said, you know what, you're not a playwright, you're a novelist. And I said, why do you think so? He said, because re read your stage directions, you're squandering the best stuff on your stage directions and nobody sees those but the actor. So um, he said, I think you should try <clears throat> your hand at a novel. So then I took a bazillion classes at UCLA Extension because I was out here in California at that point. Yeah. Mm. Ellen, for you? I, I, I grew up all alone. I mean, all alone. I'm, uh, <laughs> we had a Catholic family too. There's service, but oh, Catholic. I forgot to say Catholic here oh, too. Oh, Catholic. Oh, there we go. Yeah, all your wops to get off on the. <laughs> Jesus, so, Mary, I, I always wanted to. I just always acted. I just, I, you know, it was the last one. I was the youngest. Nobody <laughs> would play with me, so I just made things up, and I've always made things up and played. And 
I wanted to be a ballerina, but there was no dance school in my little town. So not until some girl got pregnant in college and came home. And then uh, I got up onto my point shoes and I realized um, I wasn't going to be a ballerina. So <laughs> you came right down. <laughs> you came right came... down. I came right down. <laughs> but, um, um, but actually now I'm too. I'm novels. I'm writing screenplays. I have a screenplay that's just going to take off. Fingers years. crossed. That's awesome. I got a team. I got a team. What, was, yeah. what was that process like? Was that difficult or did you just love it? Yeah. Well, I loved it because um, I first started writing when I moved out to Boulder. I was out there for a couple of years and not a lot of acting to do in Boulder. So I started writing there and I and I realized how much I, I loved getting lost in the characters and, the, and, and, and figuring out the structure. I thought I would be horrible at that. I'm, I'm actually quite good at it. And I don't mind rewrites. It doesn't bother me to kill my children. <laughs> and, um, and so, and I'm, and I, I think I've been as lucky in this as I was in acting because, you know, it happened so quickly with the acting and, and I, I was so stunned 10 years ago when the shows went down that people didn't get paid to act. I mean, so that's how lucky we were being in daytime. We got paid once a week and we lived beautifully. So then, you know, going into this other realm of, of the other side of characters, I had to figure that out. And I did most of it online. Um, and hmm. uh, it, ju it just, it was an easy transition, but it's not easy because you have to learn it. You have to have respect for a new craft. And um, I, I just well, especially if you want people to, you know, tune into that movie, you know, it's yeah, especially if you want, yeah, to do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, do you do you want to still act if if the opportunity arose? Well, it, I put myself in everything I write, so I have I have a <laughs> good role in there for me too. <laughs> <clears throat> That's um, a smart way to do it. Yeah, the television thing that was going on last year. I have a great role in that. I'm a, a goat farmer slash ex nun, um, so <laughs> right up my alley. Um, <laughs> but in this one, this is a, a biopic, um, and it's 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 um, it's about a black woman. So there wasn't a lot of room for me, but I found a way. I That's found great. A way. Gave myself a scene. That's awesome. We'll Carly, you basically gave up acting to write, right? Or I actually still... gave, up, I gave up acting when I was pregnant with my first baby and they called me up and said, we don't really need you in this series. We don't want you pregnant. And uh, yeah. Wow. And then they then, well, of course, it turned out, well, that's not really legal. So um, anyway. That all got sort of taken care of, and they paid me a lot of money to go and sit at home and be pregnant. So that was fine. And then, um, and I was already writing, and I already knew before I got pregnant with my daughter, Audrey, that all I really wanted to do was finish my novel, which I'd been working on, it seemed like forever. And, and so I did. And, by, and then I had uh, twins two years after my, my daughter, Audrey, and um, I sold my novel when the twins were about three. And then I had, um, I had a four book deal. I, I had two two book deals. And, you know, they like a book a year in, I write murder mysteries. And so in that genre, they like a book a year. And that, um, and I said to my brand new editor, when she told me that, um, I said, oh, well, I, I have a two-year-old and I just gave birth to twins. And she said, oh, we'll take 15 months then. So um, it was all I could do to write those books and raise children. I didn't have a second left over for acting. So I, I guess I took a hiatus, but there was never a day where I said, I'm now on acting hiatus or I've now quit acting. Like it just, you know, it doesn't Often. take much to not act, <laughs> let me just put it that way. And, um, and, then, and then my agent died. So anyway, um, you know, I it took a little bit to try and come back, uh, which I did about 15 years later. 
when when my when my little ones hit middle school. Um, so then I've you know I've done a, f a few films um, in the interim, but um, yeah. Hmm. Are your kids following in your footsteps at all? Oh, not even a little bit. <laughs> not even a little. So I used to go to their assemblies when they were very tiny at the, their school. They had weekly assemblies. And my kids were the ones that they hardly moved their mouth. You know, they'd be singing with their class, singing the song. And they wouldn't, you know, didn't know they wouldn't know the lyrics. They'd have to look over to see what the arm movements were doing. They could not care less. And um, people would stop me in Target, which happens in Hollywood, you know, and they'd, they'd uh, look at my children and say, would you guys like to be extras in a movie? And I'd say, no, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. And you would want them. So, um, yeah. That's crazy. And, and Ellen, Angie just turned 21. What is she uh, doing with herself? Congratulations, not, 21. Not, not getting COVID. She's been terrified of it. Um, she goes to school upstate. Um, she's back up there full time now, but most she's been home a lot. Um, and she's going, she's in media studies, but she has no, no intention of ever acting, which is a shame because she's really good at it. She's got a beautiful voice, um, but she just doesn't have the um, she doesn't have the chutzpah to get up in front of people. She and you have to have that kind of drive, that kind of love of it to put yourself through that. And she has no intention. Hmm. <clears throat> uh, Michael and Harley, you, uh, working on Texas. What what do you think Texas taught you, sort of about the business and about Acting was that one of a, an early role for both of you? I had just come off of all my children because I had gotten cast in all my children from L.A. and came out there and and I had auditioned to play this uh, construction worker, and they created this part. Which when they told me, I went, "You got the wrong guy here, guys." You really do. For uh, all my children or for Texas? Oh, for all my children. That was so wrong. It was opposite Susan Lucci. God bless her. Uh, it was just so wrong. It was to play this highfalutin, you know, r rich, rich guy. Anyway, it, 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 it was a horrible fit. It sucked. I, I'll tell you how bad it was. <laughs> first, my first, I should have known right here. The gods were telling you right from the very first day. Uh, it was a, it was the best thing in the world. I'm like, God, I get to go to New York. I got a job. All my children it was huge. Opposite Susan Lucci. Oh my God, it's gonna be what a thank you, God. Just gotten sober. It was like, I mean, the blessings of sobriety. Anyway, got down to New Orleans. So I'm on location, no less, in New Orleans. The night before, I ate oysters. Oh. On set. And I'll leave your imagination run <laughs> wild, and everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong. That was my first day. That kind of told me where, <laughs> where, where the whole experience was going to go. So anyway, I literally we parted ways. I think on a Tuesday, and on Thursday I got the audition for Texas, and on Friday I found out I got Texas, and it was like, my God, what a blessing. And I got to, I had, I had the greatest time. Texas helped turn a horrible experience for me into the best experience. We had such a great, great cast, great group of people. I had such a wonderful experience with Harley, with Randy, with get, get everybody there. It was with, with mom and dad, and Sharon, and yeah, it was just the best experience. I, I loved it. I loved it. How long did Texas run? Um, not too long. I don't, yeah, I don't think somebody will tell us for sure in a second. Um, one of our fans, Kevin, um, was asking, uh, "Do you have memories of the Hitopa storyline?" Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> Hitopa, 
Hytopa. Hytopa. <laughs> Thank you, because I did not know what that was. <laughs> well, I could Springs, never they, forget Hytopa. Exactly. We got to go to Palm Springs. What is Hytopa? Hytopa was a, a Native American something. I don't know. I was a geologist. And um, <laughs> of course okay, you were. Here's, of here's course you were. Story. Yeah. Okay. I was on the airplane flying from New York. I'd never been to California. So I'm flying there and I'm sitting next to Alex Neal, who was my yeah. buddy Ruby on the show, right? And the, the and they'd been plying us with champagne because the flight crew was fans of the show. So I was drinking away. And I said, so Alex, what time do we what time do we land in Florida? She said, Florida? <laughs> we're not going to Florida. I said, where are we going? <clears throat> she said, we're going to Palm Springs. I said, isn't that in Florida? She said, no. So I didn't even know where I was going. And then we, yeah. we got, we landed like, I don't know, 11 at night or something. And then Alex and I were thrown into the same rental car and had to find our way with a map to Palm Springs. <laughs> anyway, we were lucky to have gotten here in one piece. But um, I don't remember much about High Topa except that... Um, it had something to do with like a little Rubik's cube type of MacGuffin, and um, and it was it, uh, it was it was beautiful. Oh my God, it was beautiful. I, and do you remember Michael? Do you remember John, our costumer? Anyway, it, it was a magnificent experience. Yeah. I just have to say that. Yeah. Were you at Guiding Light when Alexandra came over, or were you gone already? No, I was gone by then. Because she came, I think, in the late 80s. Hmm. Can you talk about your other Reardon family? Greg B. Croft, Lee Lawson, what you remember? Fans were asking about both of them. You know, I ran into Lee Lawson somewhere crazy, like the L.A. Times Festival of Books or something a few years ago. And, and you know, we emailed each other a couple of times and we're going to get together. But I think she's now... a. Uh, I could be wrong about this. I think she's a therapist now. I feel like Ellen, did you bump into her on the Upper West Side or something? No, you I did, right? On uh, Broadway, uh, downtown, like an eighth in Broadway. She's just walking up the street and I was walking down and like, Ma! <laughs> Ma! Yeah. 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 That's New That's York. What, you run into people. New York, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Oh, and then I ran into Greg Beecroft years afterwards in LA at a blockbuster video. <laughs> and, and the funny thing was, um, I was having like, I, I was having an argument with my boyfriend who I later married. And, um, <laughs> this, this is anyway, um, Apparently, I was upset and talking a little too loudly because from like, you know, the aisle behind me, I hear this voice go, Harley, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> so he came around and I, th I thought, okay, I feel like I'm in outer space right now because I'm having this terribly emotional moment with my fiance and here's Greg Beecroft, who I haven't seen in, I don't know, 10 years. It was anyway. That's so funny. Did you did you uh, expect uh, Tony and Annabelle to be so popular? No. I, everything surprises me. People's reaction to everything so related surprised me. Not <clears throat> least of which the fact that they're yeah. still recognizing us on the street. I mean, to this day. Yeah. Well, like I said, I'm not kidding. Here we are four decades later and fans are very excited. Fans tuning in and watching and commenting right now about this, you know, group of actors who, you know, spent what, three to five years? What was the longest? Who? Just two for me. I was there four, but I was with these guys for three or two. Gotcha. We were only there for two years. I followed you everywhere after it for a year, Harley. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, go I found somebody. Well, everybody should follow Harley. I mean, 
And, and Harley, you still, because when we were doing the Guiding Light Christmas thing, you, you're still in touch with uh, Leslie Ann and Carolyn Clark and Mark. Well, Carolyn is my best friend. We've gone through all of life together. We are, we both come from families with eight kids, mm -hmm. speaking of Irish Catholics. And um, we, we oh call- Oh my God, that's- we're, we're like we're like sisters. We just consider each other sisters. I'm I'm godmother to her oldest son. She, oh, wow. We've seen each other through just everything that people go through in life. She is as close as my sisters to me. Didn't you say she's moving soon? Yeah, she's gonna move back east. Oh, is she in New York or like no? Um, <laughs> probably Rhode Island. Oh, back home. Mm -hmm. Way up there. Oh, yeah. Yep. She misses wow. her family. Oh, wow. She was my roommate for a year and a half, I think. A year, maybe. Just a year. Oh, while well, you were at Guiding Light? No, uh, out in L.A. Well, oh, after, okay. After I, when I left, uh, when I left as a little turns for that time, she was out there. She was my roommate. And Ellen, some fans were asking, you had decided to leave Guiding Light, right? After those four years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just figured, you know, I, I just started. I wanted to see what else. Yeah. Do. And that, that's the right time to do those things. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, um, and it wasn't for any other reason than that. And then, um, um, went back to, uh, as well turns when they, when Pratt and Gamble took me back, um, cause my mother had just passed away. So I just thought, you know, mm. this is, I've, I've been out here for four years doing it. Um, well, and those big life changes, you know, yeah, it was set you on a path, really. Yeah, yeah. And then I remember, it, speaking of Gail Kobe, she she called me. It was just after I'd had Angie. And um, I was out at my house out here, and, um, and Doug brought the phone out to the backyard because we were having a big meal at this big table and, and handed it to me. It's like, and it's so far away from the base. It was like, all he said was, it's Gail Kobe. And I picked up the phone. I went, Gail Kobe? And the phone died. So <laughs> for the rest of her life, she, I'm sure she thought I hung up on her. But she's like, I did. <laughs> I actually, I actually kind of like Gail. Even though I do remember when Marsha Clark had, had time off to go uh, do a pilot season in L.A. And she was right in the middle of your story, Michael. And Gail said, no, you can't go. You can't go. And she said, well, I'm, I'm going. I've got my apartment. I've got my car. I've got everything. Yeah. I'm going. And she said, no, you can't. We've built this whole story around. She said, why? I'm going to go. And she said, she's down the hall. And she said, I don't want to have to kill you. <laughs> and, and, she and, and she did. And she did. Well, you you did. I remember that. Very you well. did, though, yeah. didn't you? Michael, did you kill her? No, I didn't kill her. No, did who, I? no I, maybe I did. You know what? She died from Carol, the dreaming Carol death, did didn't she? Just, no, Carolyn died. Well, Carolyn died, but didn't Marsha too? Marsha died somewhere. Carol, Marsha ended up dying. I only I had a contract where I could get out after a year, and if you, I ended up getting a pilot, and I got out because I was in this dreaming death <laughs> that I had to get out of, <laughs> and I got out. So she might have had me be. I don't know because I was gone. I might have been responsible for her death too, but I remember that. Oh, Marsha, and then you left town. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Faster, faster. <laughs> but Harley, you're still in touch with Marsha too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Marsha's my accountability buddy. In fact, every time when I say yes, and I, I later think, why did I say yes to that? I should have said no. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I'm always like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Oh, sure. And then I'm like overwhelmed and can't get out of bed because I'm so overwhelmed with my life. So anyway, I asked Marsha if she would be my accountability buddy because she's really good at saying no. Like, <laughs> no, I'm not interested in that. Nope, not going to do that. So she said yes. So every time I say no to something, I email Marsha. Said I said no to something else. <laughs> well, movie that would have taken all my time and not paid me. She goes, it's good for you. Carolyn and I have talked, you know, but she's been too busy with work to do this show. And I would love to get her. And I'd love um, if you wouldn't mind putting me in touch with Marsha because I haven't been able to find her. <laughs> yes, but she's going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> she she Marcia, may. I, I got to say, she's got a fantastic career. 
um, doing voiceover. She's done some of the, she, she's great. She's really deeply into that. And um, yeah. Ellen, do you know that because you keep in touch with her or you can hear her voice when you're. Oh, we fell out of touch. We fell out of oh. touch. So, uh, and I don't, I don't, I don't have my ear tuned to, uh, you know, for the longest time I wasn't allowed to watch television. We only had two TVs and Doug got one and Angie got the other. And I, <laughs> I just had clean house. <laughs> wow. Um, do you have a favorite role you've all played? What, whether it's on stage, movies, TV? I actually played Elvis once. Was that fun yeah. for you? I loved it. I was a real live Elvis impersonator. What was that for? A play called Graceland. Oh, with, appropriately. Yeah. <laughs> with the acting company that I worked with in, uh, in New York. Harley revival in Vegas, baby. Come on. I, <laughs> um, I did a uh, cat on a hot tin roof with the uh, Nebraska repertory theater one summer. And that was pretty, it's a pretty spectacular role. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big Tennessee Williams fan. So I would say that was one. And when I was at NYU, I, I played um, Viola in Twelfth Night, which was another great role. She gets to be a boy. And um, that was fun. But, you know, I also have to say there were moments when Annabelle was my favorite. The very beginning when I was introduced and every time I would show up and they didn't introduce me, like you would just see little pieces of me for a couple of weeks. But every time I'd show up on on screen, they would play It Had to Be You in the background. That's right. And, and it was the most wow. mysterious entrance of a character. And it was always through Tony's eyes, like, who is she? And then I'd be gone, you know? So anyway, but, um, but I must say that playing Brett Wheeler was one of the most fun things in the world because she was, she was really just ahead of her time. She was just a, she was just a tough little cookie. She was a geologist. I was fabulously wealthy. I got to wear really kind of edgy clothes. And and I had the best family in the world. You did. You had a great brother. <laughs> an amazing father and mother as well. <laughs> uh, yeah. We we had a blast doing it. We yeah. sure did. Yeah. I have to look fight. for clips to Texas because I really have not seen, you know, much of Texas because it was off the air, so there's not a lot, but you know, was Beverly McKenzie there when you were there? Yeah, yeah, and you know, what a lot of the fun was too that I'll bring up was that we took the car out to Brooklyn, so we'd meet at a cafe, for example, mine was at 72nd and Columbus, or or uh, I don't know where yours was, Harley, but way downtown, yeah, way downtown. So, you, but you get to go out, you had a 45 minute drive out to Brooklyn, yeah, and you got to become friends with everybody. So you not only had the cast from Texas, but you had the cast from uh, another world yep. who at that time had a guy by the name of Morgan Freeman, uh, had a woman by the name of Kira Sedgwick. Hmm. Had, I drove with uh, Kira. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so we became- Oh, so Texas and another world would share cars as well. Correct, correct. Oh, wow. So it was very, it was a lot of fun. It really it was, was a lot, lot of fun. fun. And so he, what was he, it like 20, whatever many years later, you had to start do, doing that again to play Alec on, on World Turns? Was it I surreal? Didn't, I didn't have to do that. I, 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 could, I was 10 blocks away. I walked to work because that was over on 57th and 10th. Oh, it was World Turns on 57th. Oh, you, yeah. you didn't have to go to Brooklyn. I didn't. We, Brooklyn, we, yeah. we moved to Brooklyn. <laughs> oh, you did. That's right. That's oh, right. I thought I didn't realize it. Yeah, yeah. it was still on 57th when you yeah. were there. Yeah. Oh, that's a lot easier. Yes. <laughs> More better. <laughs> oh, 57th. Like what Michael, what huh. Michael is neglected to say, though, is that those cars going from Manhattan to Brooklyn, that was happening like at six in the morning. <laughs> yeah. there, there was that. Yeah. It's, if if you're not an early person, I I take it you don't like the early, the early bird hours. Now, 
But <laughs> I love it. I still wake up early. I love it. Yeah, me too, Ellen. I'm up yeah. five, usually five. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. I the first thing, the first show I ever did off of Guiding Light was Cat and Hot Tin Roof. No oh, way. Yes. Going from a soap opera to Tennessee Williams. Yeah. <laughs> and she walks in. She closes that door, the bedroom door, and it's the whole first act is she just doesn't shut up. Yeah. Yep. It it's was true. really tough. Well, yeah. but it must have been a. a you know, Guiding Light must have helped quite a bit with the, the you know. Well, script. we all obviously did Cat in a Hot Tin Roof then. You did too? Yeah. Where did yeah. you do yours? I did mine at the, the theater back in Michigan. Oh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was in, uh, where, uh, in Virginia, Virginia State. Okay. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Great play. And Great Alan, play. when did you do Cat in the Hot Tin Roof? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Big Daddy. <laughs> hey, there's still time, but not yet. <laughs> always tomorrow. <laughs> there's yeah. always there's always tomorrow. Ellen, what was the best part of playing Maureen? Um, working with Peter. I really liked working with Peter. He was just fun. He took he took a lot from us. Um, but working with Peter and Michael O'Leary was really fun. Oh, God bless. God bless you. Um, well, I'm, I, I'm sure Michael was as funny back then as he still is today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Peter. And I Peter. saw Michael actually on a FBI, a small yeah. one. Was yeah, he yeah. last week? Is it, I didn't recognize him at first. I saw was he playing play. a priest? No, yes. Was, wasn't he a priest? Was he a priest or was... Wasn't he the guy that went in the bank? I, the I know he had two things that he did recently. One might have been the priest. I don't I know. I didn't recognize him at first, but I saw the credit and went back. And yeah, so he's working he's over here now. Yeah, he is. He he does real estate yeah. on the side, but he's definitely still working. And he's got yeah. a he's got a great play that he's um, put on already with some guiding light actors, and and is trying to get it, you know, really he's off the breathing under dirt. breathing breathing under dirt. Correct. Yep, breathing under dirt. It's it's great. Oh, the priest was SVU. Okay, he was on yeah, SVU. So. so yeah, so you you were right, FBI. Michael. Do you, what, yeah, what's one of your favorite roles that you've? I don't. I, I've I've had a lot of fun doing a lot of different stuff. My play, the play I did with uh with uh, called Scar, with Ed Harris was terrific. Kind of played like a Sam Shepard type of character. That was a lot of fun. Um, I don't know. I, I feel so blessed and so lucky. I got to work with some of, some of the great old guys in the business. Eli Wallach played my dad. Yeah. You know, uh, Robert Mitchum played my dad. Um, Sharon Boyd, Stone played Boyd, your Boyd Bridges. Sharon Stone played played your wife. Played my wife played my wife. Yeah, yeah. But did you did you work I, with Jack? Private eye, Jack. probably. Yeah, did Josh. Work with doing that. But Jacqueline Smith on Rage of Angels. Did you get to work with? Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. She's she she's she's been my you know since I was ten years old. She's a sweetheart. I ran into her about a year and a half ago. She looks terrific. And, yeah, uh, I I yeah. actually got blessed. She did this with me, which was amazing. Oh, okay. As a as a you know somebody growing up on Guiding Light, this is amazing. You know what I mean? It's like you know. Sure. Um, you know, I grew up on those things. Sure. Uh, yeah, you've you've both Harley. I mean, all of you, um, Ellen, and you worked with Cheryl Ladd, didn't you? Yeah. On a movie, right? Ed Ed Marinero. Marinero. Ed, he's a great friend of mine. Ed. Ed? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Wait a yeah. minute. I I didn't work with a Charlie's Angel. You didn't work with a Charlie's. Get yeah. no, she, Charlie. Which one? Which one? <laughs> You did, you did it, or you did? No, no, I've I've been robbed. Because you're an angel, you don't need to work with another one. Oh, it's you're not an over. angel in your style. It's not over. Yeah, it's not over. Are you working on a new book? <laughs> I'm working on a book that I've been working on for so long that it feels like an old book. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it's my sixth novel, and it's been taking me. Yeah, it's been taking me a really long time. So um, I did one of the characters from Charlie's Angels. And then <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Sure what What was it like seeing your your first one on a bookshelf for sale? It, it was thrilling. I have to say, it truly was thrilling. Um, 
Yeah. No, it was a it was a it was a dream come true. Um, selling it was exciting. <laughs> yeah. But you know, like the first time that any like I'm sure everybody remembers that first big job. Well, Ellen, like just your guiding light story. Like yeah. the the first time of any big new dream fulfilled, even even if it's you know crummy part is so exciting and there's nothing quite like it so kind of stunning yeah it's fine with when when really excellent things happen you don't jump for joy and go out and celebrate and everything you just kind of go wow yeah wow yeah then you cash that first check then you go out and celebrate yes. <laughs> yeah <laughs> what was that? What was that like? Do you remember your first big, you know, paycheck? And well, I had you... borrowed money from um, oh, who was the casting director of Guiding Light? Betty, Betty Ray. Ray. Betty, Betty Ray. Ray. Oh, I had I had no money, and uh, uh, so I had to borrow some money from her. So my first paycheck was just to pay her back. Wow, but it shows what a. I mean, I've heard stories about Betty. What a class act. Mm -hmm. oh, she That's was. amazing. Yeah. Real school, yeah. I bought a, a used IBM Red Selectric typewriter with my first paycheck. And, you know, in retrospect, if that wasn't a sign that I really wanted to write, I don't know what is. But yeah. and then I paid off all my NYU loans. And then I paid my big brother back who helped me through school. Do you what, still what? have a typewriter? What? Good question. Good question. I, I, no, I don't know what I was thinking, but I I don't remember where it ended up or when I left it behind. But I guess, you know, with the advent of computers, I never bought another typewriter. That was it. Did you learn to type or do you? Yeah, I'd learned to type back in, <laughs> back in high school. Ninth grade, I think we had to learn to type. Yeah, it was a, right. It was a, you know, back then it was a part of the curriculum. It's true. I never learned but, to type or wait on tables or I had no fun. Oh, I was a good waitress. I had a terrible waitress. That <laughs> was the best. I was did only you, okay at typing, but I was a good waitress. Did you have any jobs in New York City at restaurants that you remember? I remember every one of my New York City jobs. So I started at Beefsteak Charlie's, Midtown. <laughs> and then um, the Knickerbocker Cafe um, in the West Village. And then Phoebe's on the Lower East Side, which is still there. And um, that got me through NYU. And uh, I had to get permission to wait tables because first year students are so overworked at the School of the Arts that I had to like, I had to get permission to have a job um, wow. and it was crazy. Um, but uh, after Phoebe's, I did a place called Garvin's restaurant that's not there any longer. And, um, and that's where I was when I got my first job after acting school, which was a, a horror movie called The House on Sorority Row. And I was at home I was hand lettering the menus for Garvin's, which was one of my many jobs at the restaurant. And uh, they called me and said, you got this job. I didn't have an agent at the time. And I remember just uh, getting my waitress stuff on, heading over to Garvin's with the menu. And I said, here you go. And this is my last night of work. And it took me a long time to get rid of my waitress shoes because I wasn't really sure that I wasn't going to end up back there. But <laughs> Texas right after the horror movie, so it was okay. Is I know like the horror genre is pretty popular. Like, do you still get recognized for that? <laughs> Only when she blood curdlingly screams. <laughs> yes. I know. I have a. I. I have. Yeah. I do have a good scream. Um, no, not for that one. Um, Greg Beecroft heard it. Yeah. <laughs> From a few rows away. Yeah, I don't think that was his favorite. 
<laughs> yeah. From a, from a few rows, he probably yeah. the hair on his back probably yeah. stood up because the two of you were in, you know, not in New York City, in California, and you hear this strange. You know. She's following me. <laughs> it is again. Ellen, did you see Larry was just on the new Amsterdam? No. Larry Brigman? No. Yes. Yeah. So Oh, huh. no, Michael, you're watching everything. I need to see. I want to try and watch that one. Yeah. The New Amsterdam. I don't even know what that is. It's uh, Is that the correct show? He was on New Amsterdam, correct. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a Fox. I think it's a Fox show. NBC show. NBC. Doctor right. show. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Shot in New York, I think. So I'm you sure it out? He wouldn't go anyplace else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just saw yeah. a picture of him from the 70s. He was really a looker when he was young, when he first came on. The weren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? 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 What did you learn working with Larry? Uh, I don't know. I mean, just I. Uh, I don't know. We didn't really learn much from from each other. We all just did. Um. Um. I remember Larry was a little irascible at times. He was very much like his character. In that oh, way. yeah. But Dr. Heart, John. But with a heart of gold kind of thing. Yeah. Um, just, and all of them, you know, Larry and Don and, and uh, just funny, 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 funny. It was just wonderful. Uh, just going to work and hanging out with these guys and talking. Um, but so was Larry, Larry and Don and Scott and Benji. Oh, all it's hysterical. Yeah. Funny, yeah. yeah. But I guess, you know, I, I loved going to see Larry. He was always doing a play. Always, always, always doing a play. And it was just it, that. That's what I learned from him, to keep working in various places all the time. So I did a lot of, I did a lot of theater when I could. And especially when I had live young, it's like, I gotta get out of here. So I would go do theater at night. Um, so I guess that's, I guess a work ethic. I learned a work ethic. You know? <laughs> Doing everything. And a couple more things fans are asking, uh, Lisa Brown, what do you remember about working with Lisa? Talk about working. I mean, she was doing Broadway at the time. She's doing 42nd street and she, and, Tap dancing, tap dancing, tap dancing everywhere. She was constantly. I saw her last performance of 42nd Street before she had to quit because she was like seven and a half months pregnant. Well, pregnant, I remember that. that yeah. That's the first Broadway show I went to as a, uh, my theater department in high school took us to see her on 42nd Street. You yeah. could not believe somebody that pregnant could be dancing up a storm the way she was. With Jerry Orbach. It's great. That's right, yeah. Jerry Arbach. Yeah. Crazy. I totally yeah. forgot. Yeah. Uh, Harley, fans have been asking about what you remember about being killed by the big C on Santa Barbara. Oh, so um, <laughs> so my uh, my boss at that point out here in California, Mary Ellis Bunham, was the executive producer, and she called me into her office one day, and she said. Listen, I have bad news. You're dying. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'd been on the show for a year at that point. And um, it turned out they had just sold to, they had just sold the show to New Line Television or somebody, New World, somebody, anyway. And they were trying to cut costs. And they said, well, who's up for a raise? And they said, well, Harley is because she's coming up to the end of her first year and an automatic raise get, kicks in, right? They said, well, kill her before she, you know, <laughs> gets to her. Off so with I said, Mary Ellis, I said, oh, okay, well, how long have I got? And she said, well, you have till Tuesday. And I said, oh. And I said, um, do, I, do I have at least a, 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 a distinctive <laughs> kind of death? And she said, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We think so. <laughs> and then what I really remember is, um, so I'm reading my script going, Wow, I'm killed by a giant letter C on top of the Capitol Hotel. Okay, so um, I thought, well, it, it, it sounds dramatic. And I got to work that day and they had just built the set. And the letter C, it was like, 
you know, it was this styrofoam orange thing that, you know, it looked like about this big, not very big. And I thought, what? And um, so I just remember thinking, oh, this is laughable. And But what was cool was that everybody was just doing the best work of their life, you know, crying over the poor corpse of me, Mary, <laughs> and Ellen, who was pregnant and the baby died and I died. And, you know, just to, to be dead with my eyes closed and just hear just my fellow actor friends just sobbing over me. It was <laughs> delightful. It was like Tom Porter, you know, coming back to watch his own funeral. <clears throat> It was so moving and I felt so touched by it. So, so it was cool. But that styrofoam, like if there was any great acting done, it was the fact that we were all reacting to this styrofoam orange thing. Like it was, you know. So what did it do? Fall off the building? It, yeah, there was a big windstorm. I was, you know, on a sound stage in Burbank and, uh, but it was supposed to, I was supposed to be on top of a hotel roof and there was a windstorm and the letter fell over. I guess they must have done it in post and it looked better on TV than it did on the sound. Moving, television magic. Mm -hmm. Television magic. What have you all learned about yourself during this crazy past year of quarantine? Something that you didn't already know? I'm such a hermit. I really loved it. <laughs> yeah, me too. I've been perfectly happy being at home, mostly in the basement. I've been living in the basement, writing in the basement. And uh, Is that your Zen place to, to write? Well, it's away from the dogs and the people. So, yeah. It's my, really cold out here. But you're at the beach. Definitely cold at the beach at this time. Ellen, where are you? Where are you living? I live in the East Hampton. Oh, <laughs> she's fancy. Normal. She's <laughs> fancy. I know. It's not fancy at all. I live on the <laughs> Bay side. I live on uh, Gardner's Bay. Not on the Bay. There's a lot of rich people between me and the water. <laughs> and Michael, did you learn anything about yourself? I learned nothing. A lot, really, yeah, because it was an opportunity to dig deep. It was an opportunity to, to to quiet down, to listen, to ask yourself some important questions. What's it all about, Alfie? And I think hopefully it was the same way for most people. I mean, we certainly were able to, ironically, the earth couldn't breathe, and it was a disease that killed us because we couldn't breathe. But finally, the earth could breathe by us shutting everything down, learning ecologically, how important it is health-wise, everything, just how everything is connected and how it's time to go within and recognize the, 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 the blessings that you have and the things you need to do to connect, that it's all one. The universe is all one. And what happens to one happens to the whole. So again, all you can do is take care of yourself. And the more you take care of yourself, you take care of your brother and sister. That's what I learned. Michael, wow. that was beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, well, fully vaccinated here. So doing my. Fully. We're all fully. I was a test subject. So I've, I've oh, been really? back oh. sober. So what, what is that like, Harley? What is that like? Like, how does that happen? Do they well, it was really cool. Well, my son was the, was patient 00001 of the Pfizer phase three trials. I don't know how he figured that out, but he's just, he's an interesting kid. So he said, mom, you can do this too. And um, but then my daughter's freaked out. So I, I backed out, but then they called me up and said, would you reconsider? We need more people. But then they needed only certain demographics and I didn't fit. They said, okay, but if you wait two weeks, you can be, you can be in the, one of the early test subjects for Johnson and Johnson, which is about to go into phase three. So I said, sure. So it was, it was fun. Um, it wasn't a big deal. I don't have any fear of needles. I have no fear of vaccines. Um, I've never had a bad reaction. And uh, so I thought it's a, you know, it's a small thing that I can do. 
because not everybody, not everybody would think of that as a good time. But for me, it was like interesting and easy. So I just showed up in Anaheim. I mean, the worst part was driving to Anaheim. And, uh, and then I, you know, I've had to go back for a lot of follow-ups because they take a truckload of blood from you to study, you know, the after effects. But um, yeah. Well, that's amazing. And it is amazing, you know, medical science and what they did in a year for to yeah. help all of us, you know, it's really something. Well, they, had they, had, they had studied it for a long time. It wasn't yeah. just a year that they put it together. Right, but I mean, you know, so, it, you know when, when people get all upset about, you know, it only took a year. It's like, no, 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 no. This is a this is a lifetime that we've been studying these viruses. So I still know some people that are not getting vaccinated. And I, I find that just amazing. I think. Perfectly. I, I do, too. But, you know, I've also um, I know that there are people that do have reactions to vaccines and it's a small percentage, but nevertheless, I wish you know, those people have a reaction and they're doing it for that reason, but they're just doing it because they, they just don't, they just don't. Want to. I know I find it really fascinating people's various strongly held convictions, both yeah. for and against. But I thought, well, for me, it's an easy thing to do and it's a tiny thing to do, but why not? So uh, after the storm that you were having in, New yeah, Jersey. it hasn't. Well, no, it was in New York that they said the hell. I mean, it's it was windy here, but not so much. Is it coming to you right now? I'm looking out. I'm watching the. I'm watching it start to come in. Yeah. Wow. We can use some. We need some rain. <laughs> oh, it's def It's definitely about to do so here. Well, it's been a delight to speak to the three of you as always. I know the fans were so excited, and uh, continue to. Ellen, keep us posted on your movie. Yeah. Harley, I hope you finish yeah. book six. And Michael, <laughs> are you auditioning from home? Are you? You know what? In this environment, I'm just. Uh, if it's meant to be, it'll come. I, I'm kind of. I'm kind of uh, of the ilk of. Uh, if Let it's it meant to be, it'll be. You know. Are yeah. you in Las Vegas, Michael? I'm sorry. Are you in Las Vegas? I am. My buddy lives here. He said, you know, around New Year's, he said, why don't you come here? Get out of L.A. because L.A. was horrendous. And I said, okay, I'll come there for New Year's because we can go to dinner and out, well, outdoors. That kind and, of best. <laughs> I'm not on that. But he's the one because I said, well, I got to do my therapy. I'm going home. He says, I got – he's a pro golfer. So he says, I've got guys that will work on you. Why don't you just stay here? Then the more we worked on – on it, we finally decided to do the surgery. So I did the surgery and I got the best guys in the world to do it. So I'm st he's like, stay here and finish it off. So I'm here for about probably three more months. Good. Nice. Yeah. Enjoy I'm it. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. It's got Are a jacuzzi, it's got a sauna. I got oh. it. Yeah. Stay there. Uh, are, are we all invited? Are we all invited? <laughs> Come on down. Come on down. Uh. Stay all right. well, stay I, well, everybody. Yep. Can I just say, after all of our talk of the drug years, that I did get sober while doing Guiding Light. So I finished oh. Guiding Light sober. Wait, and yes, Michael, you and you got sober before Guiding Light, you said. I right? did. I did. So um, Michael helped me. Nice. So how, congratulations. That's, Yay. Yeah. that's yeah. an amazing thing. And especially now four decades. Well, there was a little, I decided I'd step out a little bit and re-examine that for a while. <laughs> but, 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 um, it is bumpy. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely, yeah, it's not, yeah. E it's not easy at all, but, no, and I think, no, but I'm back sharing, right. but sharing it helps other people because it, it's not an easy process. So, I have some friends, so I, I know. Yeah. yeah. I'm back. And well, especially I, during COVID, it's nice yeah. to be sober. Yeah. And and that's some of the blessings again of this whole time. Zoom. I mean, Zoom mm -hmm. has just been a blessing for especially, you know, 12 step programs and for everybody else. It's been a real godsend. So and and to have this opportunity to talk to you guys. It's just been well, yeah. I mean, to see, yeah, I mean, just connecting. I mean, that correct. that's why I really do. Like I can't even imagine, you know, the pandemic of 19, whatever. I mean, families and 
grandparents and, you know, Ellen, you know, with Angie at school, like if you, you know, you can FaceTime, you can do all these things where you can be connected. That, that meant, say it again. Every morning, mom. <laughs> <laughs> what, what makes, what, what, what frightened her so much? Just the whole thing? Is she? She's kind of like me. She's a clean freak. Um, mm. But uh, so that, and, and, you know, the minute they went back up to school this last fall, um, she's in a sorority. So everybody just went berserk and started drinking and partying and it, and it just all, so she, and she was worried about, you know, Doug and I, because we're old now. But we're all vaccinated now, so it's all it's all fine. And she's going off to Florida, and then she's going upstate with her boyfriend. So I think she's overcome it. <laughs> but you look marvelous, darling, and you know you do. Ah, exactly. we're all marvelous. We're darling. marvelous. Yes, we are. Exactly. Well, stay well and stay healthy, all of you. So good to see you. Love you guys. Bye. Love you too. Bye. Okay. You're so welcome, Michael. Bye, Harley. Bye, Ellen. Bye. I don't know how to get. <laughs> You're out. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Harley. And thank you, Ellen. Uh, I want to remind everybody that The Locker Room is proud to partner with SoCon Live to bring your favorite daytime stars to, to your living room with free live panels starting May 1st. Check out SoapConLive.com to see the complete schedule for the As the World Turns, the Doctors, General Hospital, and One Life to Live panels and learn how you can connect with your favorite soap star today. Remember, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do so. You can do so just like that. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow.